Wave is a startup company that was started up 18 years ago <laughs> by two PhD physics candidates at the University of British Columbia, and they took a class on entrepreneurship and said, let's start a business. What else would you do? And so what should we do? Well, we're gonna start, what do we know about uh, quantum stuff? Let's start a quantum business. Well, that led to collecting patents, and then after a while, ideas for how you might build a different type of quantum computing, qu quantum computer came along, and then that finally led to D-Wave. And where we stand today is, this is sort of the, the short version of it is, that we have four customers with systems installed. We probably have had $50 million, of, done $50 million of business with those four customers. We probably have a $25 million backlog today if systems have been ordered but not yet delivered, and our hope is it will grow that before the end of the year. But would also say at the start, it is a far different type of computer than any of you have ever worked on unless you were alive in the 1950s and worked on analog computers for radars or something like that. So it is, uh, it's early days. And there is, I, I love things like this because we're at the point where there are gonna be lots of ideas and let's try things and try this, you know, one architecture or another. And in the end, there will be probably several winners and it'll probably take several years to get there. So this is one of the first of the quantum computing companies and goes back to the ideas, depending who you believe, was either Benioff or uh, Feynman. I like Feynman because I met him first in 1983 and I was running computing at Los Alamos he came there and gave a talk on the uh, anniversary of the laboratory's 40, the 40th anniversary of the laboratory, which started as the Manhattan Project in 1943. He ran the computing division at Los Alamos in 1943. I ran the computing division there in 1983 and, and for a while around that. And uh, after he gave this talk, and I don't know if you can see it, but it's, he's, his was the keynote talk, and it said, tiny computers obeying quantum mechanical laws. And he was followed by a few more Nobel laureates and things. And after the talk, a couple of days later, these Hans Bethe and he and others were hanging around the laboratory and they wanted to see modern computers. And so what modern supercomputers were like. So, and at the time we were the largest scientific computing facility in the world. So I said, great, we'll show them to you. So I'm standing there, you know, talking a little bit about the craze that we had at the time. And he says, and I can't do his accent, but something like this. He said, you know, young man, Someday, all of these big craze are gonna be replaced by quantum computers. And I said something remarkable like, cool or ho. <laughs> I just heard about quantum computers, but interestingly enough, now 35 years later, Los Alamos became our third customer, and uh, we have a machine there, and, they, and I'll show you some of the results from their work. So basically, again, this is more not for the experts in the room, but for others to back up a little bit. What we try to do with quantum computing is rather than fighting against quantum, quantum mechanical effects like we've done in digital computing for a long, long time, because in that world they can cause bit flips, current leakages, those sorts of things, we try to take advantage of the quantum mechanical effects. And in the world that we live in with uh, D-Wave, the, the world that we've come from on the digital side, bits are binary. They're a zero or a one. They're separable. And if we hit a barrier, whether that be on a transistor or if we're doing a search, we're looking for the lowest valley, we have to put more energy onto the transistor or into the search to climb the side of the hill to look over and see if there's a lower valley on the other side. And what we try to take advantage with our computers is superposition, where our bits or our quantum bits are a zero and a one and both simultaneously and somewhere in between. We build superconducting circuits and we'll show you what those look like in a little bit. We also use entanglement where if my fingers were uh, our qubits, my, uh, I guess I have the equivalent of 12 fingers right now, but if my 12 fingers were able to become entangled, then I can make coordinated moves without having to do a lot of communication and things between them. And then lastly, quantum tunneling, and that's the one that'll be the most obvious as we talk about the analogy for how our computer works. And if we hit a barrier, rather than having to put energy into the system to climb it, uh, it's been demonstrated that we tunnel through it. The extent that all these happen on our machines is still to be determined. We haven't measured the sort of the depth of all of these uh, properties on our machines, but they're all clear, it's documented that they're all 
in operation and uh, helping the calculation to some level. So the ideas for quantum computing, again, uh, Feynman or Benioff uh, were uh, the originators of the ideas. David Deutsch in about 1984, whom many of you know, wrote a paper on quantum Turing machine and that sort of kicked off thoughts about how you would build an architecture and around that uh, sort of theoretical at the time architecture where a list of or a host of people really generally really smart mathematicians who started writing algorithms for this theoretical machine. The one that's probably the most well known is Shores who basically promises with Shores algorithm you could factor any given number and do it instantaneously fast. And um, so that's either a really good thing if you're into trying to figure out all the codes that had ever been encrypted or a really bad thing if you run the encrypting side of all the codes that had ever been done. Uh, we don't run Shor's algorithm on our computer nor does it run at any great size on anyone else's today that we know of. So, but these algorithms started coming along in about the mid 90s and this is just a little snippet again for those who aren't uh, in the quantum computing industry every day uh, from Science Magazine about six months ago I would say. And it, it lists, and we'll give you these slides if you want, but it lists the sort of five or six different ways that people today at least are building qubits. The ones that we use and you've heard a little bit about today are superconducting loops and then ion traps. And uh, so, but there are a host of other technologies. So if you're gonna build a computer, a, a quantum computer, you need to think about, okay, what kind of qubits am I gonna use? And then how am I gonna organize those qubits into an architecture? And on the, ar so these are a list of what the qubit potentials are. And on the architecture side, the three major ones that we've heard a little bit about today are the topological architecture, which is what our friends at Microsoft are working on. And that is, and I don't mean any offense to anyone who's not doing topological, but that's probably the most elegant of the architectures. It, but it's probably also the hardest, going to be the hardest to get implemented. So it's probably a ways off from here and we, I see our Microsoft colleagues and we talk about it and kind of laugh and kid each other because on the other end, our architecture, which is adiabatic, is probably the easiest to implement as demonstrated because we've been in the field with them for a few years now, but is also the one that is maybe the furthest from ideal quantum computing and is also a little harder to program unless you have grew up in an analog world and we'll show you what that looks like in a second. And then the one that most people talk about are the ones that our friends from Rigetti and IBM and others are working on, and those are the machines called the gate model machines. And they're sort of in the mid levels of uh, sort of ease of use and how long it will take to get to them. But in rough numbers, um, you know, sort of thinking about where they are in terms of applicability, uh, our machines, if you had a scale of uh, you know, one to 10, and I'll thank my friend Thomas Lippert from Ulish, who's here somewhere. They've done work on sort of categorizing where the different technologies are and to be able to be applied. Um, ours is probably, you know, being used for customers in the field, more to come this year, we hope, T to use it probably an eight or something out of 10. Gate model is probably four or five, something like that, in the, uh, uh, topological is two-ish or something like that. So also sort of evidence, I think, of maybe how far away they are before you'll see them in production. So once you've picked the type of qubit you're gonna use, the architecture you're gonna use, in the case of D-Wave, they ended up, based on some theoretical work that was done in the late 90s by Professor Nishimori at Tokyo Institute of Technology, some folks here at Ulish, and also uh, Eddie Farhi and his group at MIT, there was this new idea that maybe, in fact, you could build an AD, you could build a computer following an adiabatic model and use an annealing model. Uh, ideas for that go back to simulated annealing papers from Metropolis and Teller and others in like 1952 or 53, a technique that we came to call simulated annealing. And the idea is, again, this is just a sort of an analogy for how to think about it, but if you had the Alps, say, and you were looking for the lowest valley in the Alps, what our machine would do without adding or subtracting or multiplying or dividing or shifting registers or doing anything like that, it would find the lowest valley or valleys in the Alps, probably. So it's probabilistic and in our case, not deterministic. So you, you know, and 
tr typical digital computer, you run a problem twice, you get the same answer. And ours, if the problem is like the Alps with steep mountain ranges and somewhere a low valley, you'll get, and you ran it a thousand times, say, you might get 916 answers in that low valley, and then you might get 27 in the next lowest valley, and 13 in the next lowest valley, and then you might get 43 that make no sense at all in diff different places. But if your problem is more like the Sahara Desert, where there are no steep mountains and where there are lots of low energy states is what we're really doing, is collapsing to a low energy state, you'll get answers all over the place. And we'll come back to that in a second. So quite different than anything, so the answers or the distribution of answers you get is dependent on what, what your problem looks like. So with our machine, it's really simple. There's one instruction, one machine language instruction, and you have to somehow figure out how to pack, how to turn your problem into an energy landscape and then put it into this machine. So it's the original really, really, really reduced instruction set computer, um, but, and we've been working on software to try to make it a little easier, but, but that's the challenge, is taking a real world problem and mapping it onto this machine. So with that in mind, it looks like it would be good at three classes of problems, a particular subset of optimization problems, discrete combinatorial optimization problems, maybe machine learning, and probably sampling and maybe Monte Carlo sorts of applications in the long term. This is what it looks like. There are two systems here. These are in our uh, manufacturing facility. They're large. The, uh, the box they come in is large. It's about three meters by three meters by a little over three meters high. And you can see three standard uh, racks out in front of it that house network equipment, the refrigeration equipment, uh, as well as network monitoring equipment. And inside all of that is a chip that we're gonna see in a second. So the computer is one chip that's housed inside that giant box. Yes, we can shrink the size of it. It was uh, designed that size so that you could fit three people inside to work on it at the same time. Over time, no doubt, it'll it'll get smaller. We were to, Some of us were at a conference a couple of days ago. I don't think we'll see one of these in your car or your cell phone anytime soon um, because it is super conducting and is super cooled. So if you open the door and walked in the box, you'll see a big, look, it'll look like a giant soup can that's about, oh, uh, two-thirds of a meter in diameter and a little over a meter deep. And if you took that outside soup can off, you'd see another, a little smaller can and another and another and another. So it's sort of like the Russian dolls that stack together is the idea. And then if you took all of those off, this is what you would see. And one of our f friends, Rob from Blue Fours, is toward the back. Uh, his company makes uh, dilution refrigerators, and there are others who we've seen pictures of in the, uh, uh, in the presentation. But our machine, when you walk in at the sort of in the, uh, at that upper level of it, it's at room temperature, whatever temperature the computer center is. And then we take it down to a liquid nitrogen temperature. And then within each of those cans, it gets colder and colder and colder until where the processor is today, we're running at about 12 millikelvin, which is colder than it is in outer space. And so, so you know, this, these machines then, can you get this, what originally were physics experiment sort of refrigeration to run for a long time. And we've just taken the machine down about two months ago at Google and it had run for 22 months without failure. So these things are you know, now getting pretty reliable and so you can think about them uh, uh, running for running production codes. But the challenge is we're upgrading it right now. So the Google NASA machine will be our first 2,000 qubit machine in the field and it takes us two or three months to change the chip and then recalibrate it. So we still have some work to do uh, to be able to do a quick upgrade. Um, the whole system uses only 25 kilowatts of power and so the chip itself uses none. If you look at the chip, this is what it looks like. And this is, this one has 2,000 qubits on it and you would see little boxes on it. Those are unit cells, each of them having eight qubits. And those qubits interact with each other and we won't go into that in the interest of time today. But, you know, I'll, I'll bet I've talked at nine Moore's Laws Dead conferences in the last uh, two years. And I wanna say Moore's Laws Dead long live Moore's Law. 
because this looks vaguely Moore's Law-like, where at uh, D-Wave we've been able to roughly double the number of qubits that we have every two years or so. And so we're just starting to field the first 2,000 qubit machines and designs, we're working on designs for systems that would have four to 5,000 qubits. Now our qubits are different, though the, the underlying technology is the same, because of the way we, our, our architecture works, where we have to, we sort of hold it in a, a quantum state for a while and then we dissipate that quantum state or allow it to collapse to a low energy state, we don't have some of the issues with error correction and coherence and things that others do. However, you run our, you don't run a problem once on our machine, you run it many times and then get the distribution of answers back. So pluses and minuses to all that. And I thought just would end here with what are some of the customer application areas. So we have, as I mentioned, we probably have you know, $50 million of computers that we've installed and uh, upgraded. And Lockheed was the first customer, and uh, University of Southern California Information Sciences Institute is their partner. Machine is located in Marina del Rey, California, and software verification and validation was Lockheed's first uh, application area, followed by, op and by the way, it's the Skunk Works part of Lockheed that uh, bought the machine. Uh, and so aeronautics optimization and then the USC folks do a lot of work on performance characterization, device physics and those sorts of things. Second customer was Google. NASA Ames lives right next door to them and so they came up with a deal where NASA Ames has huge supercomputer capabilities and so NASA Ames runs the computer and uh, Google gets about half of it and NASA Ames and its affiliate USRA which is a, an a, organization that reaches out to universities uh, to do research uh, has about half of it. So, and the first time I walked in where, to the room where the D-Wave machine was, I thought, I've been here before. And it's a room that used to house a Cray many, many years ago and now houses a D-Wave. And you can see the applications there ranging from machine learning, which is Google's primary interest, to a host of things that mostly from the NASA side. Los Alamos became our third customer. We installed a 1,000 qubit machine there last August. And they have probably done more work across a broader set of things. I'll give you a little flavor for it in the remaining two minutes and 18 seconds. And, <laughs> and uh, then Temporal Defense Systems is a small company that is our most recent customer, cybersecurity application for an unnamed end customer, uh, all US customers. Um, these are, I'm gonna show you two slides from Los Alamos. Uh, these are their slides and they've run two sets of many projects uh, where they opened up for proposals around the laboratory and their using community and said, give us proposals on the D-Wave and let's see what, you know, what, what of interest comes along. And about uh, half of them are optimization problems, about 20% machine learning, uh, device physics, uh, software uh, environment, and then a collection of other ideas, some of which are good ideas, as you can see from their slide. And, um, this is a list, uh, and I won't read this to you, but this will be in uh, the slides if you would like. And just, I think you'd be interested in reading some of the names and things of the projects. For each of those, there is a PDF that describes what the project is that's available publicly now. And uh, Volkswagen, you may have uh, seen and uh, heard uh, uh, earlier today about some of the work that we've done with Volkswagen, and it's the first application of a quantum computer that you could explain to your mother. And so that's the, and I don't mean that in a bad way at all, um, but uh, that's, you know, this is something that regular people, I think, could equate to rather than device physicists and things. So that came out last March, and we expect to do more work. This was, interestingly enough, on the machine learning side, there was a paper by Oak Ridge and others about uh, three months ago that looked at how do you do deep learning and what are the best architectures to run it on. And their conclusion was that actually three architectures are best for different parts of the, of the deep learning problems. And the upfront learning part, they believe, if you read the bottom sentence, uh, that uh, quantum computing may be the best at sort of denoising things. So our friend from Google, Hartmut Nevin, believes that's the case and says that, you know, typically in computing we've had garbage in, garbage out. But perhaps with quantum computing, we can have garbage in, meaning noisy data from the real world, but gold out. So a lot of work from here to there, but that's the idea. Another one from uh, Skunk Works about machine learning and uh, NASA Ames on machine learning. And 
uh, with that, uh, these are a couple of websites that have stuff from our users group meeting as well as the Los Alamos presentations. So thank you very much. And I don't know where we are on time, but... <laughs>